This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Jones wrote the best-selling book, The Green Collar Economy, How One Solution Can Fix Our Two Biggest Problems, which provides an incredible blueprint for retooling American industry and ideas for how to create innovative uh, uh, solutions in the clean and renewable energy space that will benefit all workers across all classes including the poor and the underserved. Van's message is a very American message. We can incubate new technologies and new companies and businesses in the green economy. And these new businesses can create jobs for hundreds of thousands of American citizens. And that's the double bottom line. Please join me in welcoming Van Jones. You know, because we have all these divisions in our country right now, uh, usually if you're on the left, when you go talk, you only get a chance to talk to people on the left. Or if you're on the right, you come to talk, you can only talk to people on the right. I am so blessed that people on both sides of the aisle will come together to hear me talk now. It's this incredible thing. And so I really want to take it seriously uh, that we have uh, people with passionate views uh, on both sides of important issues for the country. Uh, I don't think any one party or one person has all the answers. And I hope this will be a good opportunity for us to actually uh, share our best thinking. But I'm going to direct most of my comments to the students. I know we have people here who are not students. I'm going to direct most of my comments to the students, mainly because I am so jealous of this new generation. I'm envious, somewhat resentful, <laughs> uh, because you guys get a chance to come off the campus at such a, uh, a momentous time for the country. Uh, you've got really big problems, which means you get a chance to come up with really big solutions, right, and have a blast. I came out of school in 1990. Uh, and the 90s, unless you were in a dot com, they were pretty boring. And so uh, I'm jealous of you guys. You've got three big problems. If you're on the left or on the right, it doesn't matter. You've got three big problems that face the country, and they, they fall in your lap. And you are going to have to figure out some way to come together as a generation. Uh, I, I, I don't mind the debating and that kind of stuff. I'd rather you guys be debating and fighting and arguing than pretending that there's no issues and just playing on your Xboxes. So the fact that people are only playing on your Xboxes. <laughs> Um, so the fact that there's debate, that's a good thing. But at some point, you've got to figure out how to deal with a mess. You are inheriting from my generation a hot mess. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how you guys deal with it. Let me tell you your three big problems. Um, first of all, you've got to figure out what the next American economy is going to look like. All right? You've got to figure out what the next American economy is going to look like. Why? Because the last American economy is done. It's toast. Uh, it's upside down in the ditch. The wheels are turning, but it's not going anywhere. Because it was built on three fallacies that both political parties, both political parties uh, sold the American people on. Both political parties told us for 20 to 30 years that we could have an economy based more on consumption than production. Both parties said it was perfectly fine for us to ship all our jobs overseas, shut down our manufacturing capacity, and we would have an economy based on consumption. That's how we're going to grow the economy. Uh, we're going to have an economy based on going to the mall, uh, uh, shopping online. Right? And don't worry about where the stuff is getting made. 
Both parties signed on to that as a deal. Uh, it turns out you cannot go on. So for the last several years, we were actually consuming, uh, I think, you know, 10% more than we were producing. You can't do that forever. But both parties said you could. Number two, both parties said it was okay for us to build an economy based on credit and uh, uh, debt rather than smart savings and thrift like our grandparents, right? I mean, I don't care who you are. If your grandma could see your savings account versus your credit card statement, right? You would get a whooping or a timeout or whatever is culturally appropriate, right? 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 Because they didn't play that. They didn't play that. Uh, our grandparents' generation, our great grandparents' generation, they were great savers, they were thrifty. And the idea that you have a, a, the credit card bills that you've got and the savings account that you've got, you would, you would be in deep trouble. But both political parties created policies that made it uh, seem that forever and forever we could just stack the American economy up on credit cards, personally and from the government. Right? And guess what? That house of credit cards just collapsed. Right? And both parties are to blame. Third big fallacy. Both parties acted as if uh, we could base our economy forever on ecological destruction rather than ecological restoration. They acted like we could just continue to go on clear-cutting and uh, 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 with this incredible wastefulness and disrespect of America's beauty uh, and, 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 and turn beautiful living things into shrink wrap packages and shove them into landfills forever and ever and ever and call that economic growth. Well, guess what? It turns out that there are actual limits. Uh, God didn't create any junk. The Creator didn't create any junk. There's an actual wisdom that governs all, all systems, and there's a limit to how much pollution you can put in the sky, how many living systems you can destroy to make strip malls, and how much stuff you can shove down in landfills. And so here you are. You know, sucks to be you, right? Right? You know, you get a chance to come off these campuses with all this debt into an economy that both political parties and everybody who's five years older than you or, or older designed that crashed. All right? So you've got to figure out the next American economy. Now, my suggestion. Uh, when what I argue is the next American economy is going to be very different. First of all, we're going to actually go from having an economy based on consumption back to production, back to building things rather than borrowing, back to making things here again, right? Like that's going to be a big part of what we got to go back to doing, start building for ourselves what we've been relying on other countries to build for us. So we're going to go back to having a productive economy rather than a consumption-based economy, number one. And that's how our growth is going to work. Number two, we're going to have to go back to thrift, conservation. I don't know how uh, the idea of conservation became uh, some left-wing liberal idea. I mean, I love it. I mean, thank you very much. But uh, I don't think my grandma was some flaming radical when she said, waste not, want not. How is that other than a common ground value? Uh, we have been blessed in this country with tremendous resources. Tremendous resources. Uh, I don't think it's uh, anybody in red, uh, a red state or a blue state can have an argument that it's better to waste it than to conserve it and honor it and respect it. Okay? So uh, we're going to uh, move into uh, an economy that's going to be based on thrift, on smart savings, on being efficient, right? You've got to figure out how to get us there. And also, we are going to go into an economy that's going to be based not on destroying the ecological beauty and resources of our country and of our planet, but actually, not destroying it, but actually restoring it. And, and, and identifying those entrepreneurs, the innovation, uh, and, 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 and those policies that will help us better do that. So you're going to be leading, as young people, so you ain't going to have no job, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying. You're going to have to go out there and create. I mean, I, 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 I'm, 
Honest to a fault, you may have noticed, right? <laughs> Candid to a fault, you may have noticed. But since you ain't likely to have a job, uh, you're going to have to get out there and create new jobs, right? You know, it's not about you going out there and getting a green job. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you that you're going to go out there and get a green job. More likely, you're going to go out there and give a green job. You're going to go out there and create one, right? You're going to have to become uh, creative and entrepreneurial in ways that my generation didn't have to be, right? But as you do that, you're going to be uh, helping to redefine and recreate the next American economy. But guess what? If that was your only homework assignment, you would be up real late, but it's not. <laughs> that was just one of your problems. The economy, <laughs> fixing that, that's just one. <laughs> you got two more, just as big. Guess what? <laughs> I'm, I'm envious, I, I am. Guess what? You also get to come off the campus not just at the end of the last failed model for, America, for the American economy, failed in that it, it ran its course. Put it that way, it ran its course. We're done with that one. Gotta come up with a, with a new one. You also come out at the end of the cheap energy bubble. You guys were worried about the housing bubble and so on. Dad, don't worry about that. <laughs> That's a little bitty bubble. That's a little tiny little frothy bubble. That's a little baby in the arm with a little bottle. Oh, you got a little bubble. Right? You about to have to deal with a big bubble. Big bowling ball, weight, dense, huge. The cheap energy bubble that's about to pop. You say, what is this guy talking about? I just filled up my SUV today. <laughs> Seemed pretty dadgum cheap to me. <laughs> Do you guys remember ancient history? I mean, you're students, right? Do you remember way back? Now, if you're you know, business major, science, I'm the, the history major. Do you remember way? The graduate student history, the history graduate. Do you remember way back to 2008? <laughs> you remember that? Do you remember that? Do you remember four dollars a gallon? You say, you say to yourself, I remember that, but you know, we fixed that problem. If I remember correctly, my friends and colleagues in the other party were so distraught by the $4 a gallon stuff, they were you know, chanting the you know, drill baby drill. Uh, now I guess it's you know, drill baby still. Uh, but, you know, I mean, there was a real serious concern. And then it went away. Did it go away because we discovered some Big new pot of oil? No, no, that's not why it went away. Did it go away because we got radically more efficient with the way we use oil? No, 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 that's, that's, that's not why it went away. Did it go away because the whole economy collapsed? <laughs> and brought down all prices globally? That's right, that's right, that's why the oil prices went down. Well, shoot, well, that was doing that. So, wait a minute. <laughs> so if the reason that the prices went down was because of the recession, then when we come out of the recession, <laughs> hello, hello. When we come out of this recession, you get a whole different experience. <laughs> you get a chance to say, I wish we had that $4 a gallon. I should have saved some. <laughs> I should have kept a bucket of it just to look at it. <laughs> See, there's this thing this thing has this 
impact on you, your generation. I mean, we still haven't got to number three, ma'am. I'm just, I'm on number two, right? And, and don't, don't take no pills. I mean, we're going to solve it, but I'm just saying, you got problems, man. <laughs> you got this thing, this place, this land. It's not the land called Hanali. It's the land called China. It's the land called Asia, India. A miracle is happening there. Finally, Asia is standing up, shaking off the legacy of feudalism and uh, uh, bureaucratic communism and beginning finally to unleash its genius again. You know, China was a dominant power a thousand years ago. It's actually more normal for China to have the kind of influence it's about to have again. This has been an exception. And finally, Asia is coming back out. And it's a beautiful thing. They have hundreds of millions of people in poverty right now, crushing poverty, so poor that the poorest person in America would be like, I ain't going there. <laughs> they poor. <laughs> Take me back to the housing projects, man. I can live like a king. <laughs> so it's a, it's a beautiful thing that's happening. But it creates a problem for you. Just got back from China. You too? What's your name? Nick. Nick just got back from China too. Oh, yeah. Growing like wildfire, huh? Construction cranes. Construction cranes everywhere. That should be the national symbol. <laughs> just don't even need no flags. Why do you have the flag? Just put a construction crane there. Because they just. Growing like crazy. I was in Dalian. Dalian, you ever heard of Dalian? I went there. Well, nigga, I know you went there. I do. <laughs> Is he famous on your campus? I love you. Go, come talk to me after. Um, look, I was in Dalian. You've never heard of Dalian, have you? <laughs> no, you haven't. Because I had. You know why you haven't heard of Dalian? Because 10 years ago, I think there was something, what, like 60,000 people live there? I mean, 100,000? Right? Today, 6 million. Today, 6 million. And that's just one city like that. All right? And you go there, and every building is brand new, like shiny nickel new. Like, is this a building? <laughs> it's so new! I mean, you're looking for like the bubble wrap around the building. It's like, where did the building come from? <laughs> it's new. I mean, it's, it's like, it's it got that new building smell. <laughs> like, every building and for like six million people. And you think to yourself, there must not be one brick anywhere in the world, one piece of glass or steel just for Dalian. They have 20 cities like that. They're gonna build 20 more. Now, what happens when people move into cities? Now, the crazy thing, of course, in Dalian is you have these incredible shiny buildings, and then people, like literally, you know, some people, you know, kind of drive, driving around the people with the oxes. <laughs> who are like, damn, this is. <laughs> Baby, I'm glad we moved, you know? Like <laughs> I mean, literally, you can see the past pouring into the future, literally on the street, okay? Now, how long do you think Joe and Mary want to have that ox? For about three minutes, right? They're not going to want it. They had the ox was doing them fine in the country, but they just moved to Dalian. The ox is going to be an ox burger, <laughs> and they're going to want a car. That means your demand for oil globally is going to go up. You think that just coming out of this recession is gonna push your oil prices through the roof. Wait till the full demand from Asia kicks in. Now your problem is, right, you can't get the demand for oil down because of Asia, and God bless them, and you can't get the supply up. Oh, now 
Somebody took an economics class. Why do we have these slick and slimy beaches now all down the southern part of America destroying America's beauty? Is it just because BP is you know, incompetent? Yeah, we can talk about all that stuff, but why were they drilling the biggest, uh, deepest well in the history of oil expo exploration? Because all the easy to get oil is already in your car. So you're now at the end of the cheap energy bubble, folks. Now, I'm not quite sure why my generation was so enamored, enamored with petroleum in the first place. You know, petroleum, after all, is the post-whale oil strategy for fuel. You realize this, right? You, know, you, think, you, might, you think to yourself, why do we use this black gunk out of the ground? Right? Well, before, we were using whale oil. Ran out of whales. <laughs> Guess we'll use this stuff. <laughs> And that's what we've been doing for 120 years. And you think it's cool, you know? It's like, look at my car. It's like, this is the post-whale oil strategy for transportation. Um, gotta innovate. Gotta come up with something new. But if you insist on trying to continue to power America in the same old way, what you're gonna get is oil workers dying on rigs, which is what we just got, what you're gonna get is slick and slimy beaches. What you're gonna get is our coal miners, who are America's heroes, being asked to either go deeper and deeper into the earth to pull out coal and risk their lives to keep powering us the same old way. Or worse, we're gonna to continue to ask, your generation is gonna to continue to ask coal miners to blow the tops off their grandmother's mountains with the mountaintop removal and scrape the coal out, okay? Or we can innovate. But look, if all you had to deal with was having to reinvent the American economy to make it more productive, more conservation-oriented, and more respectful of the earth, that'd keep you up pretty late. If all you had to do was come up, come up with viable fuel alternatives to this old dirty stuff we've been using for 150 years, that might be an all-nighter. But you got another problem. You got another problem. You get a situation like this, the one that our country's in right now, this kind of change, this kind of challenge. People are either gonna turn to each other or they're gonna turn on each other. You get this kind of stress on a system, and people are either gonna to turn to each other or they're gonna turn on each other. And when you have a country that's getting more, go ahead and put it on the table, ethnically diverse, at the same time economically poor, that's a recipe for a battleground not a common ground. See, what you don't understand, you take it for granted, you young people. I, I envy you. You take it for granted. But see, America is a miracle every single day. I just got back from Tanzania. I was just in Africa, literally 48 hours ago. You got some countries that have two ethnic groups and they fight all day long, can't get anything done. Two. In this country, we have every color, every faith, every sexuality, every gender, everything you can possibly imagine, all in one country at one time, and we make it work every day. That is a miracle in the human, in the, in the human story. You can't find a story like America if you go back 10,000 years, okay? We are, it's a miracle every day because we're based on an idea, e pluribus unum. But your generation, you have this much stress, more and more and more diversity ethnically, but more and more downward pressure economically, 
this beautiful common ground could turn into a battleground. Now, there's only one way to prevent that. It's got to be a pathway for more economic prosperity. Right? When economies are growing and there's more opportunity, then we are a lot better at figuring out ways to share and have, have the right kinds of solutions. So you've got to figure this thing out, man. Now, in some ways, sucks to be you, right? But you get it right. You buy us a new American century. You get it right. And suddenly America, a rainbow nation with every color and every creed and every, all get, getting along, solving tough problems, actually dealing with the toughest you know, situation we have facing humanity right now, this energy piece, a rainbow country working together, coming together to solve problems, guess what? We're an example for a rainbow planet. We can tell anybody in the world, calm down and work it out because we're doing it here. So that's the promise, that's the prize. Plus, you don't bake at the planet, right? You don't wind up uh, uh, being an, uh, a nation enslaved by your energy dependency. So there's a future out there. You get to be heroes. But how do you get there? How do you get there? Now, I've got some ideas about this, but i got to recognize half of you probably don't want to hear from me because you heard some things about me and some things that I said, some of them foolish, some of them taken out of context, and it's hard for you to hear me. So let me just tell you a little bit about how I came to some of these ideas. So at least you have some context for it. Then I'll give you my ideas. So we're Americans, we can debate ideas without debating personalities. And then we'll go home, because it'll be late by then. <laughs> I was born to a family of Black Panther militants. No, actually. <laughs> Recording. <laughs> you were about to run out the door. <laughs> we got it, we got it, we got it. <laughs> Not gonna make it that easy for you. Um, I was actually born in 1968, uh, the year that Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, the year that Dr. King was assassinated. Uh, on the edge of a small town in rural West Tennessee, uh, Jackson, Tennessee, Madison County. Uh, my dad uh, was born in Shelby County, Memphis. Huh? Yeah, Orange Mound. Your dad's from Orange Mound, so you know. They might have stayed in China. <laughs> My dad grew up po, 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 po. Your dad too? My dad grew up in abject poverty in Orange Mound, Memphis, on Cable Street. Mm. So he might have gone, he might have been happy to go over to India, China, someplace. I don't know. Grew up very poor. His dad died when he was five. And the last thing that my grandfather told my father, the last thing he said in life, he told my father, uh, you're the man of the house. Take care of your mother. Take care of your sisters. And then he died. So here's my dad, five years old. And he took that on. Now when I came along, whenever we would go to Memphis to see my family, everybody always called, my dad's name was Willie, he died two years ago. Everybody would call him Old Willie which made sense to me, since he was old. <laughs> what I didn't get, they started calling him Old Willie when he was six. He used to walk around and try to look like and stand like his father at six. Uh, he 
started working when he was nine, joined the military, uh, became a cop in the military, got out of the military, put himself through college, put his brother through college, uh, put two cousins through college, and then put me and my sister through college. Uh, tough, mean, hard. They don't make men like that anymore. They really don't. Uh, wouldn't take nothing from nobody when it came to making excuses. Uh, he, would, he became a, a principal of a junior high school. And they gave him the worst junior high school in the county with all the poor kids and the terrible kids. And, the, and he's, he, he turned the school around in two years and turned it into a, an award-winning program because he wouldn't listen to any crap from any of these kids from the housing projects or any place else. Show you how tough he was. <laughs> Anybody ever see that movie, Lean On Me? You see the movie Lean On Me? It had Morgan Freeman. Come on, somebody. You can see the movie Lean On Me? All right. It had Morgan Freeman. It had this terrible high school and like the back talking kids and the, the whole thing, whatever. And he was like all oh, tough guy and like put them in line and they were like rebel and he like crushed them and all like, like that. Right. I was watching this movie with, it, with my dad. And I'm like, why am I like that? <laughs> I said, Daddy. After the movie was over, I said, Daddy, you're just like that dude. And they lean on me. My dad said, hmm. I would never tell no child to lean on me. <laughs> Teach these kids to lean on their damn cell. <laughs> Tough man. And uh, no excuses, just excellence. You know, he didn't want to hear anybody talking about racism or anything. He said, look, you know, I don't see any dogs or fire hoses keeping you out the library. I mean, he was a tough man. Uh, and so, uh, so we grew up with that. Super patriot. Uh, and I was, you know, trying to be, you know, like him. Uh, you know, see, y'all too young to know. Do y'all know, excuse me, the older folk, just bear with me, because I got to educate these kids. <laughs> Do y'all know that it used to be a time that TV actually went off? <laughs> Can you get a witness? Anybody remember that? The TV used to actually go off. I know it's hard for y'all to believe. And we didn't have no internet. We had no internet. Okay? And you'd be watching TV, and it would just go off. And it would be color bars. Ooh. Or snow. And you have to wait till 6 in the morning for the cartoons to come on, I swear to God. This is in America, okay? But, but, before they went to the color bars, what'd they play? The National Anthem. And they would show the Grand Canyon. And they would like show an eagle soaring. Just laugh, see, the ones that didn't see it laughing, the rest of us getting choked up. You about to cry. He about to cry. See, see, see. <laughs> man, it was moving, man. Every night, every night. And on Friday nights when they let me stay up late, me and my twin sister, I would stand at attention. man. Right next to my dad. So I didn't, with a dad like that, the other thing is, I didn't get in no trouble, <laughs> okay? Now I'm trouble that I get in, because <laughs> my dad was Willie Jones. <laughs> and, you know, he, you know, he would say things like, boy, if I ever find out you were doing drugs, I'm, I'd kill you. <laughs> Kill me, I would be dead in the K 
casket, gray, and he'd be like, I should, you shouldn't have been doing the drugs, man. I'm like, really? So I didn't get in no trouble, okay? I was a straight nerd, and I mean, I, I mean, see, look, I've never ever had a beer to this day. I'm not joking, okay? I was a straight nerd. And so, uh, did great in school, long story short, wind up going to Yale for law school. Okay. Get to Yale, country kid, grew up in the church, dad's a cop in the military, tough lean on me dude, right? Well, don't lean on your damn self dude. Okay, and then I get to New Haven, Connecticut, Yale, and the first thing I observe is how debauched the place was. Y'all are educated. You know what I mean. Call my grandmama. Grandmama! Okay, I would. Big mama! <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be honest. I called her Big Mama. Big Mama! I'm up here at this law school, and the students are smoking marijuana cigarettes. Big Mama, they smoking marijuana cigarettes. <laughs> I've never seen nothing like that before. And my grandma was like, well, well, baby, it's gonna be all right. You know, just pray. I was like, no, it's not gonna be all right. They're smoking the marijuana cigarettes up in here, oh Lord. And she said, no, baby, baby, but just, well, just tell your teachers about it. Well, they smoking it too. The teachers are smoking it too. I mean, oh, that's what happened. That's oh, God, Lord. You know, so I, but then I observed, you know, because I was observant, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a clever kid, you know, so. I noticed something. And it broke my heart. It turned out that about three blocks, anybody ever been to New Haven, Connecticut? Been to Yale? Okay. Three blocks from the campus are housing projects. And so I said, well, I got to get away from these crazy, debauched, uh, Jesus is watching them, drug smoking undergraduates. I was, I was telling you, know, Jesus, Jesus sees you <laughs> with your marijuana cigarettes. I just want you to know that. I'm going back to my room. Um, so I said, look, I got to get away from this stuff. This stuff is terrible. I'm going to go and volunteer in the community. Get over to the housing projects. What are the kids over there doing? I am smoking the marijuana cigarettes too. <laughs> you can't get away from them. What the heck? 18-year-old kids over here smoking the marijuana cigarettes. 18-year-old kids over here smoking the marijuana cigarettes, and here I am just sad. <laughs> but then I noticed something. The police, yeah, my dad's a cop in the military, the police would drive past the campus with their lights on and stop at the housing projects and take the kids I was working with in the housing projects out in their underwear in front of everybody and stick them in police cars. And kids I was working with went to prison. Five year sentences, 12 year sentences, 17 year sentences. Some kids got sentences longer than they were, had been alive. The kids at Yale would also sometimes get caught. They didn't go to prison, they went to rehab. We literally had something on campus, and now I'm, I'm on TV right now. If I'm wrong, you could, you know, let Yale sue me. They have on the campus something called mental hygiene, which is a rehab center on campus for kids that get in trouble doing drugs. And what would happen to those kids was they would be able to pause their grades, 
be able to withdraw, uh, get the best you know, rehab you know, drug program, uh, go to Europe for a year. And they would come back and they would have themselves together. They hit the button and they just boom, they go up and then they would boom, graduate, go to grad school, go on with their lives. And that broke my heart. I couldn't understand it. I could not deal with it. I went and talked to my dean. I said, we're up here, you're teaching us about equal protection and equal opportunity and all this stuff in these books and all the stuff that my dad raised me with and I can stand on the front steps of the law school and see the injustice. I can see it. And my dean told me, he said, well, Van, you have to understand. Those kids in the housing projects are drug pushers. Our kids are experimenting with drugs. <laughs> and I said, well, sir, I don't see any experimentation exception in these law books you're giving me. And I turned my back on everything my dad taught me. I became the angriest, bitterest person you would ever, you wouldn't even be able to be in a room with me. I was so angry. I said, I've been lied to, I've been tricked. All these things I was raised with, and I went in a negative direction, and I don't mean for a minute, I mean for years, until I just completely flat, just burned out of, on, on anger. And it was when I just couldn't protest no more, couldn't critique no more, and was just done, that I had to try and go get some healing. And it was when I went to get my own healing that I discovered uh, my faith again that I was raised with, the woods which I was raised in, uh, nature, uh, and these strange people, because if you're in Northern California, which is where I was living, so you go to the woods, uh, you don't find too many farmers, you find uh, hippies. <laughs> And, uh, and they have these uh, strange rituals. Um, they eat this magical ambrosial food called tofu. Uh, and it makes them very happy, you know. You, you know they're happy because they always say, I'm so happy to see you, you know. And by this time, I've been working in Oakland, California, working in prisons and stuff for a long time. I used to be just walking up on me. I'm like, hey, hey, you know? Hi, so happy to see you. How are you? I'm like, hey, man, get, get up off me. <laughs> Walk up on me. <laughs> Shell shock. And what is that rolled up tubular weapon you got, man? It's a yoga mat, bro. I'm <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> And they, and they drive these cars, it's, you know, it's, it's cars that don't have any pollution out of them at all. You can just put your mouth on the exhaust pipe, <gasps> you know, with no pollution. They're called hybrids. Um, and their houses have, like, you know, things on them, solar panels and stuff. And I said, you know, healthy food, clean air, clean water, New products, new services, healthy lifestyle. Why do I come, gotta come all the way to Marin County to see this kind of stuff? Why don't we have this in Oakland? What if we had all this healthy, beautiful, green stuff in Oakland? What if these kids had green jobs and not jails for their future? And I had this, it was just like a, a revelation to me. And then I heard Bill Clinton give a speech, and he said, to a bunch of angry African Americans, and he said, you know something? There's nothing wrong with America that can't be fixed by what's right with America. And it brought me back, it brought me back. Uh, prodigal son in the Bible, that was me. 
turned my back on my father. Luckily, I came back to myself while he, he had already been diagnosed with cancer. Hard worker, hard smoker, hard drinker. And we got a chance to reconnect and reunite. And what I know because of my journey is that there are parts of this country that are hurting so badly, don't have the jobs, don't have the opportunity, but don't let anybody tell you that they don't want the opportunity. They do. And now we are finally at a point where not only do the desperately poor need opportunity, we got the newly poor. who are working two years ago, who are working three years ago, they need opportunity. There's a need now for us to actually come up with something. And I want to tell you that based on what I've seen, this is what I think is possible. It's not guaranteed, and you may not get there. But let me tell you what I think is possible. If we come together as a country, you got, the great thing about being an American is you're free to think whatever crazy thing you want to think. That's, a, that's an American freedom. You can think whatever crazy, you know, color, creed, creed, that's dumb ideas, right? <laughs> And we, ain't, we ain't gonna throw you out of the country because you have you know, okay, your religion, color, or creed, your creed, your crazy idea. Right? You can have whatever crazy idea you want. You're free. And you're also free to change your mind in America. And you're free to come home. And now's the time for a whole bunch of us to come home to some common ground. Here's some common ground. Here's how we can get a new economy. Here's how we can deal with, the cheap, with, with this cheap energy bubble. And here's how we can be one country. Right. Let's build, let's tap the Saudi Arabia of wind energy and solar energy that we have right now in our own country and have some made in America energy to create some made in America jobs and put people back to work. What does that look like? That looks like your skilled machinist in Detroit right now Oh, I got a little bit of time. Who are sitting there idle, who could be building wind turbines for you right now. And you say, yeah, I'm for that. I, I, I think we need some more windmills. I didn't say windmill. I get frustrated with you, mishearing me. This is not 1850 in Holland. We don't need any windmills. We need wind turbines. Huh? Boeing level engineering. A jet engine in the sky. 8,000 finely machined parts, as much steel as in 26 cars. We have a Saudi Arabia of wind in our own country, not just in the Plain States, but up at the Great Lakes and off our coasts. And we've never tapped it. You could put your idled, workers in Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio to work right now. These are some of the most highly skilled workers in the world. Don't you let anybody tell you that American workers are inferior to anybody. There's nothing wrong with those workers. They weren't allowed to make the right products, but those are some of the most highly skilled workers in the world. And here's how you know. Huh? You got education. Let's walk you over to one of those factories and let you make a car. You're so educated. They're so dumb. Well, me and you, go, we'll go make a car. We could be in those factories for three weeks. We wouldn't make a car. We might make a hubcap. Be a little wobbly. These are some of the most highly skilled workers in the world. They could be building wind turbines right now and letting us begin to back out of some of this dirty energy. Uh, uh, we've got a Saudi Arabia of solar power in our country right now, not just in the Sun Belt, but on rooftops across America. I'm going to tell you something. Guess what? Solar panels don't put themselves up. They're great. They ain't that great. Right? Somebody's got to actually do the work, the work of putting up those solar panels. That's American technology. Where did solar panels come from? Back during the 70s when the energy crunch, uh, Jimmy Carter and all those people put all this research and money in there. We came up with wind turbines, solar panels, and then we left it on the table and let the Europeans and the Asians come and get it, and now they run what should be American in, in, uh, industries. Right? 
But you have the opportunity to put people to work, building those wind turbines, uh, putting up those solar panels, uh, retrofitting buildings so they don't leak so much energy. And what it takes is uh, getting the rules right to unleash a tidal wave of innovation and entrepreneurship. See, this problem is too big for government to fix. It's even too big for not-for-profits to fix, I'm sorry. You're going to have to have a market-based solution. Only, only free market solutions can take these kind of things to scale. But here's your problem. Your generation's got a problem. Markets, the verdict of the last century is clear. Right? Markets solve big problems, but markets work according to rules. And right now, the rules in your energy sector are wacky. Right? You actually are holding back innovation. You, the, 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 the way that we have the rules written right now locks us into place with these old, outdated, dangerous, and outmoded and increasingly expensive power technologies. The minute you change the rules, just like with the internet, you get the rules right on the government side and get some of the public investments right on, right on the government side, and then you let the entrepreneurs take you home. That's what we got to do on the energy side. So we're going to have a fight about that. Well, how much you know, government role and when, how much it's going to cost. You have that fight, but what you want to do, you want to get to a place where you've unleashed a whole tidal wave of new technologies and new innovation. You do that, you get more work, more wealth, and better health for your country, and you bring the country together. Why? If you're serious about green and clean solutions, you make Republicans and Democrats happy. Why? This guy's crazy. <laughs> He's kind of funny, but clearly insane. There's no way you could possibly make both Democrats and Republicans happy. Why? If you did that, we, we, we might be able to be one country and, and like, no, he's trying to trick me. <laughs> Listen to what I am saying. I'm not asking for more welfare. I'm calling for more work. Liberals, progressives should be happy because he's talking about the environment and poor people and jobs and blah, 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 blah. Great. Stay happy. <laughs> Don't leave me. <laughs> but conservatives should be happy too because I'm not calling for more welfare. I'm calling for more work. I'm not calling for more entitlements. I'm calling for more enterprise. I'm not calling for the redistribution of existing wealth. I'm calling for the reinvigoration of our stuck energy sector to create new wealth. Huh? 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 I'm calling for clean air. I gotta tell you, I know for a fact, know for a fact that clean air is better than dirty air. <laughs> I didn't get that out of the Democratic Party manifesto. <laughs> for the health of our children, for the health of our children, I know for a fact that conserving energy is better than wasting it. I know that for a fact. I know for a fact that if a country can fight pollution and poverty at the same time, it has a moral obligation to do so because of the uh, long-term benefits for future generations. That's common ground. That's common ground. And so what I want to say to you is that there are some uh, people on both sides of the aisle. And I used to be one of them now. I'm not trying to say I'm some perfect person, huh? You are not gonna find somebody more partisan than Van Jones. But there are some issues that are too serious for that. And you got people on both sides of the aisle 
They can't tell the difference between the issues that we can do this food fight silliness on and issues that are too, that are too important for our energy security and for our economic security to fool around with. And what I'm going to tell you is that you young people, some of you guys are on the right, some, guys are on, some of you are on the left, this is the one issue you better come together on. And, and, and the, I'm going to tell you right now, liberals can't figure it out by themselves. We are too biased toward government solutions. Conservatives can't figure it out for themselves because they have a, a too thin a critique of the present uh, rule-based constraints on the markets and our existing energy system. We need each other on this, man. Now, when you reach out and you try to become one country, you're going to get it from the left and the right. What most people don't understand is the past five years, I've been getting the heck beat out of me by the left. You know that. And you know that. They said, this guy thinks he's a green Jack Kemp. Said, well, yeah, actually, I do, yes. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, that's bingo, man. <laughs> is that bad? Oh, sorry, I didn't, you know. I was getting the heck kicked out of me by the left. <laughs> This guy used to be a radical, he used to be down for the people, now he's like on, you know, green capitalist stuff and we hate him and blah, 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 for years, right? Hurt, right? Then you get the other side. Go all through your, you know, dumb jokes and stuff and try to make you seem like you're somebody you're not anymore. Hurts, hurts, especially when you know the stakes. But we can't get pulled into this food fight politics, me and you, us in here. We can't get pulled into it because the stakes are too high. And you have to come to a deeper patriotism, a deeper love for your country. You've got to come to a place where you can, you really understand what it means when they say liberty and justice for all. That really does mean for everybody, not just the people you like and get along with and the people in your, your color state, liberty and justice for all. You want folks in Appalachia to have a chance. You want folks in the agricultural heartland to have a chance. Liberty and justice for all. America the beautiful. Right? And you have a patriotic duty to defend her beauty. If you sang that song as a child, you have a patriotic duty to defend her beauty against the clear cutters and all these, these folks who wanted to spoil her beauty. And you have to come to a deeper love for your country and a deeper love for the people in your country who you may not agree with on every issue, but who at the end of the day, you're gonna need. And you can't afford to be in a civil war with. Huh? And so what that means is, this journey that we're on together, as hard as it is right now, will end either in disaster or in a renewed sense of common purpose for the country. And your generation has to get us there. You're the most connected, you're the most diverse, huh? The only question is, can you have that kind of love? And I'm going to tell you right now, if you try to develop that kind of love, you're going to get challenged. It's going to be difficult. But when it gets harder to love, hmm? when it gets harder to love, love harder. Thank you very much.